Okay, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Rosen, and I'm an embedded technical expert at Smile, which is a big open source company. Uh, and I wanted to talk about saf safety versus security and how the way people think when they're think thinking about safety and security contradicts and kind of tend to pull the projects in opposite directions. So before going to, into the meat of the talk, a few warning points to kind of set out what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about philosophy and culture. I mean, I'm going to talk about how people react when I talk about security or safety in the embedded context. So it's not a technical talk. It's about how technical people react from what they've learned about safety and security. Uh, my company does embedded stuff and mainly industrial embedded stuff. So that's a, that's a very special subset of embedded development in general. It's uh, very different from, say, consumer products. It has its own constraints, in particular with regard to updates, which are way more um, complicated. We'll get to it. So, just keep in mind that's not all embedded systems. That's the one I see. I see about 20 to 50 embedded projects a year, so quite a few. I can start doing statistics about them. Uh, and all projects are different. So I will tend to say, yeah, but you can have to do that on your embedded project. All embedded projects are different. Each of them has its own problems, and you always have to th think about your particular case. And since it's a um, philosophical talk, I have very simple definition about safety and security, and I don't want to go into the exact details and the meaning of those words. Safety is anything related to reliability, and security is anything related to hostile takeover in general, okay? We will try to talk a little bit about why embedded systems suck at security. I mean, everybody knows that embedded systems suck at security, and it's the next, next big, big end of the world thing that's coming around, but there are very little people that actually try to understand why and where, we are, where it comes from beyond the, the usual, there is no updates. It's more complicated than that. So just to start my talk, I would like to do a quick show of hands. Uh, in this room, who consider himself a safety person? Oh, quite a few. And people who are more like security people? A bit more, I would say one third, two third. And who's more or less doing both? I end up doing both, so that's, there are quite a few people like that. So that's good, because that means we'll have people from both sides that are going to try to think with the other pe person's hats. So, let's start with safety. Safety people are kind of brainwashed in the way they think. They're extremists, so I'll try to explain how, why, where it comes from to the security people who are not used to that. So, the first thing with safety is you want your, uh, your system to always work with a very, very strict definition of always. So, having correct software is not enough you need to prove that software is correct. So you need to prove that your software is correct. I have no idea how you can prove that machine learning is correct. That's gonna be very interesting in the coming years. You usually need to prove that your hardware is correct on safety critical system. It means that you cannot use caches because it might change timings and you don't really know how they work. And you need to prove that your tools are cor correct. Compilers. Uh, when you do safety critical codes, you have people that are paid whole time to proofread the assembly with the source code and just compare to make sure that the co compiler generates correct code because you cannot trust your compiler. And then because you need to prove things correct, you need to simplify things. So you have those crazy general rules you need to follow when you're doing a safety critical uh, code, like no dynamic memory allocation or a softer version, which is no dynamic uh, memory allocation after initialization. But anyway, you want to make sure that you don't, do not have use after free, so no free, no double free, no free, no memory leaks, no memory allocation. So it's, 
it simplifies stuff a lot, and you need it because you need to prove it. A consequence of that is that when your product is out and you discover a bug in the product, the first thing safety people will do is try to find out if the bug has any consequence at all. Because changing the code means certifying the code again, and that can be extremely expensive. So if we can prove that the bug has no consequence, that's way better. And also, when you're doing safety critical stuff, any change is, safety, is a safety change and need to be evaluated. I had an example re uh, recently from people working on hardware that was going into trains. So they, they had this little rackable uh, units that ha they had to put in, and those units had connectors on the front side with a little knob that you could screw on, and the knob was uh, linked to the unit with a little chain. At some point, they had to change the provider, uh, the provider for those little chains, and they had to recertify the hardware. Because they changed the hardware, so don't ask the questions, just recertify the whole thing. So safety people are completely paranoid, but that's why planes work. It's because they check everything. But security people are kind of brainwashed the other way. So, the big difference in security is about uh, not just things working correctly or all the time. It's more about making sure that can, it cannot be used for anything than its original purpose. So everything is an attack vector. I mean, I do a little security, but I'm not a security person. And when you read how uh, Spectre and Meltdown works, you're like, it's impossible. Nobody would think of that, and nobody could really exploit that, do they? Oh, they do. <laughs> so the whole thing is also any little hole is potentially a, a leapfrog to a bigger hole and a bigger hole and a bigger hole. So you need to do everything, check everything, fix everything. And then a big difference is security is a race. You have to find the weakness before people that are going to exploit it. You had to fix it as fast uh, as possible, even if you have to temporary, temporarily break another part of the code. That's okay, because leaving a hole is dangerous. And then you have to deploy, and you have to deploy fast, because once you start deploying, basically you publish the bug, so people will try to start exploiting it. So speed is the essence, and the whole world is out to get you. So security people, completely paranoid. But the thing is, attacks are a real thing. Spectre and Meltdown have been exploited in the wild, and the security culture, that way of doing stuff, the, the whole talk about upgrade, 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 it works. It does reduce uh, all the security threats. So it makes, us, it makes sense. So now that we've been explaining that, what happens when we have to put both side to side? You have the safety people that will tell you, your code must be proven and certified. And that's long. I mean, if you have to proofread every line of assembler, it takes years. But on the other hand, the security people, they want to go fast. And they have very good reason to want to go fast. Safety works because you know exactly what your software has to do. So you have very well-defined constraints and operating range, whereas security will just start by looking where out of the, of the range because that's where the attacks come from. You must protect from hostile behavior, not just accidents, not just bugs. You must uh, uh, protect from people who actually are here to get you. So it's a very different way of thinking about bugs. One of the big, big difference, one of the ones that has the most impact is that the way bugs go down. Safety people consider that the more, you, the more time passes, the less bug left you have. So long testing works. Long testing will reduce the number of bugs, and as long as you do not introduce new code, the number of uh, bugs left will go down. That's not true with security, because threat models evolve, and something that was safe might not be safe anymore. Some code which was state of the, air, of the art a couple of years ago might be dangerous nowadays because we have a new way to exploit it. 
So again, there is this consideration about time makes a huge difference. And then you have the idea of known bugs. In safety, you will check that a bug has no consequence, and if your bug has no consequence, you will actively ignore it. I mean, uh, there is a known bug on Airbus planes, which means you have to shut down and restart your plane every 140 days. This bug will probably never be fixed because they have a fix. You just turn off the plane and back on, and that's good enough, and they don't want to uh, change the software, because say, changing the software in any way will probably be m way more dangerous than adding a line to the manual and get your, uh, your pilot to do it, because pilots are very good at following instructions. And so, as a consequence, safety people will upgrade only as a last resort. Safety people do not care about new features. You never need new features because your product never changes. And the idea that you just fix the bug because they're here is totally impossible. It's way too dangerous. On the other hand, we had this morning, we had a, a talk, a keynote by uh, Greg Cohen Hartman who told us, Every bug fix is a security fix, and even if you don't know it, so you should take in every possible change and all the way around the newest version. And that makes sense too. That's the big problem. It's totally opposite, but both aspects make sense. So any change is a risk. Uh, any change is a risk and need to be justified, and any bug is a potential security weakness and needs to be fixed. How do we solve that? And then you have this cultural problem. Security trumps everything, Sa safety trumps everything. When your safety engineer tell, uh, tells you no, your products won't go out. And when the security uh, engineers tell you, you need to fix that bug, you need to fix that bug today. And when you discuss with product managers that have uh, products that are in the making and are going to go out and they don't know how to deal with this, they're torn because they, they're, well, they're literally torn apart between those two completely different considerations. And how do you solve them? In the embedded world, historically, safe, safety tends to win, which is one of the big reasons why you don't have that many upgrades in industrial product. Again, customer, uh, consumer products are a bit different, but in industrial products, you're like, okay, so you want to do a security fix. I need six months of testing. Do, you, do we do it now, or do we wait for tomorrow when you'll have three more fixes? Yes, but that will reset our clock, and we cannot wait six months, because in six months you have so many new bugs around. What do we do? So that was safety versus securities, and then I need to do a side note about embedded systems and upgrading embedded systems. So I kind of assume everybody here is in the embedded world, but still it's important to point out that upgrading an embedded product is very different from upgrading any other product. Uh, the first thing is that we need to have upgrade six systems that are extremely robust. I mean way more than in the data center. Why? Because if an upgrade fails, a product is a brick. There is, sometimes you have no access to the product because the product might be, um, might just be into your consumer's hands, so you don't know where they are. They might not have a network access. In particular, if an upgrade has failed, it might not have network access anymore. Some products you just cannot access. We had once an example of a product that, went act that was actually literally poured into concrete. So no, you cannot access the hardware. You need to have all cases, when, when your life, when the life of your product is very long, you have to deal with stuff that only happens once in a decade. Bad blocks, bad blocks on disk is a problem. You cannot change the hard disk and you cannot just throw away the old hard disk and put a new one. Not with embedded products. Conflicting configuration files, that's a big problem. If you have, a, well, let's call it a naive Debian-based system, when you upgrade packages, you might have conflicting files in, uh, at upgrade time. I had that one on ETC FS tab on a product and it breaks the product. So you need, even if you have a per package upgrade, you need a way to get back to a completely 
well-known state that might not be useful, but it, which is safe and is able to upgrade the product back into a good state. You need to do that. When you upgrade, you want to keep user configuration. It means that your new system has to be able to read the old configuration with all the problems of upgrading the configurations and having a problem and having to downgrade the configuration to get back to the previous version, stuff like that. And last, you need to be able to upgrade everything, maybe not the first stage bootloader, but about everything else, which means you need to upgrade your kernel, which means that containers are not a complete solution because containers do not upgrade the kernel. They share the kernel. The kernel is always on the host. So even if you want to upgrade, to have your whole system container-based and just upgrade container per container per container, which is easier because a container is more or less a single file, you still need to have a way to upgrade your kernel. And uh, kernel upgrades can fail. And when an upgrade fails, your system has to have a way to get back on its feet on its own. So the whole upgrade problem is complicated. Some systems can st stop. Fortunately, few of them, most embedded systems don't have that sort of constraint, but some systems have uh, safety critical or uh, vital features that you just cannot stop during an, an upgrade. So they have to have some sort, usually a secondary microcontroller, which will just keep the breathing system working while you upgrade the main system. And if the main upgrade system fails, then the breathing system has to work on its own on, until someone goes for the beep and replace the whole product or something. But that means that even rebooting on an embedded system can be very hard. You can't phase out hardware. I mean, that's also a big problem, is once you sell a product, how long must you maintain it? As long as you have a consumer using it. How long is that? It can be five years for some products, it can be 20 years for other products. So you need to have, back, if you do an upgrade to new version of software, you need to have it be backward compatible to the first version of your hardware. If your product uh, works for 20 years, we're in 2019, it means that you, have st you would still have to support hardware, hardware from the years 2000. It's getting complicated because it, that would be 386. 386 support in Linux is phasing out. How do you do? How do you deal with that? Deployment time is hard. Deployment time can be controlled by the user. When will your user turn your product on? Who knows? So once you have the upgrade available on your servers, how long will it take for every instance of your product to, go, to be updated? I don't know. I had some consumers, who, uh, some, some customers, where we were discussing them, and they told me, yeah, any upgrade? Six months to certify, six months to deploy. It's kind of long. And yeah, uh, very long-term support means you can't trust anybody. You can't trust your subcontractor, so that's a bit of a problem. If you go with, uh, there are lots of companies that provide uh, the base system for embedded products and will deal with the upgrades for you. Will they survive as long as your product? You can trust your technologies. It's what I said about 386 on Linux. How long will they support your hardware? It's hard, and your whole team will change. It's not, well, I'm putting it as a, you can't trust your engineers to survive, but people retire, people change job, or people simply don't want to spend 20 years on the same project. So your whole team will change during the life of your product, and you need to deal with that, and it's hard. So that was about upgrade. Security in the embedded world is also pretty different from security, the one you have in the literature, which is mainly based on the data center problems, uh, because we have our products in different places. So physical access can't be restricted. It always depends on the products, but lots of products are just out in the street. So you need secure boot. You need to make sure that only signed code can be booted because people will go around and open the hardware and steal the hardware and look inside. So that makes things very complicated from a product management pro point of view because each product has to have a unique key because if, some, if someone ha uh, hacks into one product and the product is the same, has the same keys than every other product, 
he has corrupted the whole line of products. So you can't do that. So you might need, there are multiple ways of dealing with that, but you might need a unique image per product, which means redoing your image instead of simply flashing them. That makes very complicated factory processes that you have to deal with. Very complicated is the problem of a return to a trusted state. So you have your product in the wild, and for various reasons, someone attacks your product and so someone takes over your product. How do you get it back? When you're in a data center, you just stop the machines, reformat with, and reinstall newer some software and restart it. On the embedded world, what part of the st software stack can still be trusted? It's hard. You, the first idea would be, well, I have some very rich bootloaders like U-Boot, which can do absolutely everything. U-Boot could be, is able to reinstall a Linux from a known image somewhere. U-Boot can totally do that. Yes, but bootloaders attacks are a thing. So you need to protect your U-Boot, and if someone takes over Linux, he can basically write wherever he wants in memory. So he can attack your U-Boot. JTAGs attack are a thing. So the other idea would be let's plug some hardware and have some, um, some way to upgrade via a JTAG, for instance. But if you have a JTAG port out, people will use it. So most uh, embedded processors, you can actually uh, use, um, what are they called? Uh, hard, uh, hardware, uh, software uh, switches to deactivate entirely and once and for all JTAG. So you can do that, but in that case, you cannot get your product back by reflashing via JTAG. So the only way which is kind of safe is having your first stage of boot and your uh, known good image being in a ROM. So you can reinstall from ROM and you hope that nobody will have attacks that actually corrupt the image on the ROM once it's reinstalled or you have a way to make it good again. But ROM are expensive and in the embedded world, anything that uh, ends on the bill of mat material will be scrutinized. So it might be a few more dollars on your board, but a few more dollars can be a huge difference. And you will also be working against the culture because again, there is no upgrade culture in the embedded world. That's mainly because most embedded products are products that have been around for a very long time but the idea of having a computer inside is new. I mean, if you take, I don't know, air conditioners, we've had air conditioners for, for years. And right now, every uh, air conditioner manufacturer is considering adding a small Raspberry Pi type board inside so you can control with your phone and all that kind of stuff. That means that those people who are mechanics, suddenly they have to handle all the problems of dealing with the distribution, with software upgrades, with, uh, with the lifetime of the different products they have inside. When it's a building-sized air conditioner, it means that you, which will, it will stay in the building for 30, 50 years, and they have no idea how to do it. It's not their culture, it's not their job. And again, the, and on the other hand, you have all sorts of startups that have great ideas for embedded products, but they don't think long-term. And that makes sense when you're a startup. When you're a startup, you don't prepare for the 30 next years because that's a waste of money in a way because you don't know if you'll survive that long and it's expensive and that has no real point. So both sides mean that from the start, it's hard to have something ready for upgrade. It ha it's hard to have people that are thinking in terms of upgrades. So at some point when you're developing your, uh, your embedded product and you're thinking about upgrades and how to deal with, with upgrade, you have this hard choice. Bricked or pooned? Do, you, do I put security first, which means that at some point the product will be lost because of an attack, or do I leave some sort of door for my malevolence, which means that the, he will take over, but at least the product has maybe a small chance of still working, at least partially. And you know, when I, when I go to my customers and as I ask them the question, there is a big blank because nobody wants to think about that. And those are real problems in the embedded world. You cannot get your machine back once it's corrupted. So, then you have the security update. So first, uh, when you go to 
big industrialist people like that, and you ask them how often do you think you need to upgrade their products, they will tell you, oh, it's pretty easy. We monitor our CVEs. Well, let's go, not go back to this morning's discussion, but we monitor the CVE and we look over every patch, and when there is one which affects our product, then we backport and we do a new release. Okay, how do you think this will happen? Oh, once a year, maybe? No, that's not. So as needed, as in when there is a vulnerability, just does not send the, t uh, the test of realism. So looking around at big embedded uh, makers, how often do they upgrade? Android, monthly security update. Windows, monthly security update. Linux, it depends a lot on your distribution, but usually it's more or less a rolling release type of thing, basically, which upgrades on its own. iOS, it's more or less as needed, but it tr tends around a monthly upgrade. So best practices when you look around seems to be you need to upgrade your product monthly. And that's a, a good thing, except recertifying is long. When it takes six months, how do I do it? Yes, but if it takes six months, my vulnerability window is huge. It's humongous. I mean, it's, it's, free, it's a free party for people who want to attack. And again, once someone has corrupted the product, you cannot get it back. So when we look at things from both sides, both sides have very good and very strict processes that are justified by years of good practice. Both sides have this very strong argument that their way of doing things works but they works only because they are very strictly followed. You can't do half security, half safety. You will get none. And they work. They are effective at what they are meant to do. So completely opposite, we have speed critical versus confidence critical, proactive versus reactive, and preventive versus proven. Okay, so just they're completely pulling in different directions. So, I have no magic for you. I don't know how to do both, and I don't think it's possible to do both with the way they are working currently. So to finish, we'll have a look at way we can mitigate the problem, how to make safety faster, how to get security to work better with safety critical software, that sort of things. So, we can avoid uh, prob the problem entirely. Not all products are safety uh, pr critical, but any, okay, let's say any connected product needs to care about security. So is your product safety critical, or is it so some sort of remnant culture from previous products, but that makes no sense nowadays? That works both ways. If you're a security person, will my product be attacked by, by an advanced persistent threat? Probably not. So maybe you don't need all the security level you can put in, and at some point there is some balance to do, and uh, there is um, to find out what levels of security you want, because high level of security is proportionally way more expensive in the embedded world, because, because of the way it works and the risk we have. But whatever your choice, you will need a robust upgrade system because bricking is the big problem with upgrade systems. A good way to do it, but it's also not that easy, is to have recertification go faster. That's uh, some, a, a cultural problem in the certification world. Is certification works really well. It has some very well tested processes that have been around for decades and that nobody wants to touch because they work. So stuff like automated testing is minimal, okay? So there is probably ways to accelerate certification by automating more stuff and making sure that automated uh, testing is acceptable by the certification authority. And that's not a luxury, that's not about saving costs because usually in safety critical application, they, they factor in the cost of certification. It's about being able to certify faster for security reasons, okay? You could, that's something you need to discuss with your uh, safety office, uh, your safety uh, engineer, but you might want to have some sort of fast pass recertification for security problems in um, 
and network facing areas, not the whole product. Some parts of the product will be safety first, other parts will be security first. Maybe you can only have different upgrade passes as far as, as recertification works for your security critical parts. And minimize the safety critical parameter. That's something safety people tend to do anyway because of cost, but again, it's a good thing. Try to reduce how much is safety critical. And then you have everything that's, is, that you can use to completely separate safety and security. So the three most obvious way of doing it are containers, hypervisors, and good old hardware separation. The three of them we see in the industry. Containers is interesting, but you will tend to, but they have the problem of the kernel, which is common and thus is safety critical. So you can't upgrade your kernel. It's pretty useful because it means that the network facing parts can be in a container. So your firewall you could upgrade separately, for instance. But you still have some parts that will stay safety critical, but it's cheap. And containers are now a well-known te technology. Hypervisors get it one level lower. Ba basically, you have your safety critical minimal OS on one side and a Linux which protects the network on the other side. That's mainly how it works. That's pretty good because it means that you can upgrade your whole Linux kernel included, usually. But the hypervisor is now a safety critical part. So it's easier because you will have few, hopefully few security problems in the hypervisor. So you've reduced the problem, but you might, st might still have some. And you have to prove your hypervisors, which is hard. And then hardware separation, which basically means you have two core or a CPU and a MCU next to it. There's many ways of doing it, but basically you completely separate the hardware. And that's the best solution, but it has another problem. It's expensive. And as I said, on mass-produced products, every dollar counts. And the reason why people are considering hypervisors and containers in the embedded space is mainly cost. If you had infinite money, you would just put more hardware and uh, throw much more hardware in the problem and you'd be done. But that's not how it works. And then the big part is, uh, ha is to plan for security updates. That's the cultural answer. The problem we have is not just that we don't have secu uh, security update mechanisms on embedded products. Nowadays, all projects all embedded projects have some sort of security update mechanism. They're not all out yet, but that's, that problem is solved. People want update systems. But most of my customers have update systems and don't have a team for maintenance. So you need to plan that beforehand. You have to have an agenda, a maintenance product, and because you need to control cost, you need to have a documented end of life for your product. At some point, you will have to kill your product, and if, you're, if you surprise your customer, you'll get a bad reputation for it. If you plan it from the start of the product, and you tell your customer about it from the start, you will just be following your planning, and it's a public planning, and it won't give you bad reputation. And there we have it. That's basically what I see uh, from the reaction of the people I talk to about security versus safety and how, why people just are afraid of upgrading, why, why in the embedded world we tend to have very, very old software. It's not just a problem of doing the upgrade or doing the maintenance. It's also a fear of new features. And that's something we need to understand in order to be able to talk about it. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>